Mike, we've got next week we got our movie. It's going to be good. This is one of the best movies we've ever seen. And I don't think you're going to want to miss it. It's good, good, good. It's really good. I cannot confirm nor deny that when I viewed this movie, it made me cry. <clears throat> I cannot confirm nor deny that. It's going to be good, though. You're going to, you're going to be blessed. You're going to be blessed. Spirit of Python series, lesson number six. Python wants to quiet your voice. That's the title. I hear people in the church talking about the community issues that they don't agree with pertaining to the Word of God. Um, maybe gay rights, gay marriage, abortion. I think abortion is one of the greatest crimes there is. I'm not bashful about it. But we feel forced to almost tolerate these issues, even though the Bible is quite clear on the topics. The Bible calls them immorality. Sometimes we feel totally helpless in our ability to be able to do anything about these topics of concern, and yet we've seen so many people set free, so many people set free yeah. of all these things. And it's a wonderful thing when people are set free and they really yeah. fall in love with Jesus and they fully understand. Yes. You see, Python wants to keep you quiet and feeling helpless, and he does not mind if you're upset or you disagree with what is taking place, but just do not be a voice. Don't let your opinion trouble the city, lest you're accused of a hate crime. We've got to the point now where anytime you disagree with somebody, it's a hate crime. That is just wrong. Everybody has an opinion, and everybody, I just happen to line my opinion up with what the Bible has to say. I think we should show God off in public. Most people, they stop reading, you know, the story about Paul and Silas um, when they go into the jail house and they come out and they go to the jailer's house and his whole house gets saved, if you remember the story in Acts chapter 16. Many teach that this is the end of the story, but yet the story continues. I mean, I understand why they would stop the story. Paul and Silas went to their house. He led their whole family to Jesus Christ. They fed them. They, they soothed them. They repaired the, the wounds that were on their back, and it was a great happy day. But there's more to the story. Because after he was washed up and, and he, he got his meal, he immediately went back into the prison from which... God had delivered him, him and, him and Silas. In Acts chapter 16, beginning with verse 36, So the jailer told Paul, You and Silas are free to leave. Go in peace. Now you would think that they would say, Thank you. And they would just, man, go on their merry little way. But Paul replied, he says, no, they have publicly beaten us without trial. They jailed us, and we are Roman citizens. Right there, you can just hear the gasp. You can just hear, oh, no, because Romans had, Roman citizens had rights. So now they want us to leave secretly. Certainly not. Let them come themselves to release us. The Bible says that Paul got cleaned up, he got washed up, he, he ate a good meal, but such a guy, he's got to eat a meal. And then he said, let's go back to jail. <laughs> Paul and Silas walked back into the doors of the jail. They sat down in the jail cell and they waited. They wanted to make a point. The magistrate found out that, that these boys had been beat, stripped, and thrown in jail, and they're Roman citizens, and the Roman citizens have great rights. And if these rights are not honored, then there are serious consequences involved. So the magistrate, they sent word and said, Psst, hey, Paul, Silas, you are free to go. You may leave now because we realize we really don't want you here. But Paul knew, Paul knew his rights, and he stood up and he said, wait a minute, I want the same fanfare when I leave this place that you showed me when I entered this place. I want the same people who saw me once come in 
I want them now to see me come out justified. I want them to see me come out the same way that I went in. And let me translate it in simple English for you. In the same display, and forcing me in here, I want the same display in my release. We should be saying, I want the same people that influence, that I influenced while I was in sin to see me now. That's really what this is talking about. I'm not going to go out privately. I, I, need, a, I need a public deliverance. Listen, Python don't want you delivered. But if you are delivered, he wants you to get delivered quietly, not publicly. Okay, so you've repented and, and, and so you're right with God. Just don't tell anybody. It's almost like we're afraid of telling somebody that we're a Christian. Like it's some incurable disease and they might catch it or something. Come on. Most people won't even pray over their food when they're in a restaurant because they're afraid of persecution. Now, I'm not saying you should stand on the table and give a sermon for the whole restaurant, but at least pray over your food. Amen. Remember, somehow, we went out when we were a sinner into the world, and we did the same things. You remember the things we did? We had no shame over them. You may have slept around, you may have drugged the weed, you may have dragged, uh, you know, uh, danced and, 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 and made a fool of yourself in a drunken stupor. You did not care. Now the world looks at our altars and they see people set free, tears flowing down their face, hands lifted up before God, or laying on their face in a pile of humility and maybe someone shouting or even jumping or dancing for joy, and they say, well, they're just a bunch of fanatics. Fanatics? Really? You call that being a fanatic? What about back then? What about all that? I think a lot of us were fanatic sinners. We were pretty proud of our sin. I don't know about you, but I was a first-class sinner, man. I was good at it. I decided that I want to be the best Christian I could be now. No. I want to tell you that God will have a church that's not afraid to go in public, not afraid of tongues, not afraid of interpretations, not afraid of, of prophecies, not afraid of laying on of hands, anointing people with oil, with an outward expression of praise. God, one of the things I love more than anything is when we're praising and worshiping. People are clapping and their hands are raised and people are just weeping before God. And I mean, they're really praising God. Amen. I love that. Yes. Unashamed. Amen. I'm kind of thinking about bringing Kim up here because she knows how to praise and worship and just have her stand right there and just have her do her thing in front of everybody. Yeah. Not trying to, you know, make a spectacle of her, but I just love the way she praises the Lord. Amen. We must not be ashamed of his Holy Ghost power. We just can't be. There's a book called The Life Story of Lester Sumrall. And I want to paraphrase one of the chapters entitled Bitten by Devils. Now, Dr. Summerall, he was from South Bend, Indiana. He started to see ministers. I went to Bible college there. I spent three years in his Bible school. I fell in love with this man as he was my pastor. He was the dean of the school, the president. And Dr. Summerall was a pretty famous man, and he went all over the world touching lives. He was 17 years old. He wasn't a doctor at that time. He was just... Reverend Summerall at the time. He was 17 years old and he was called by the Lord and he was dying in his bed and the Lord said, you're either going to preach or you're going to die. He had, he had a choice to make. And he, he, he had to debate over it. He said, well, all right, fine, I'll preach. And he did. Brother Summerall one of the first things the Lord called him to do was go to the city of Manila in the Philippines where there was a demonic infestation of several 
related deaths that had occurred and the Lord said you're going to go there and I'm going to I'm going to promote you there I'm going to show the world my power there was a 17 year old girl with a manifestation of demons that was there and she was in prison and each time the demons would manifest in her bloody teeth marks would appear all over her body and this was a, a national incident that had been publicized in the press for several weeks prior to Brother Summerall's arrival. Actually, it, it reached worldwide. Nobody could figure out what was going on. Everyone was confused at what it could possibly be. And Brother Summerall told the doctor that it was a demon. And the doctor said, that's interesting. I have performed thousands of autopsies and I have never found a demon in someone. But he had no other answers as to what it could be so he allowed Brother Summerall to pray over the girl. The girl was in a prison and when Lester Summerall arrived the official was told that were told that God had told him to cast out this demon in this girl. And so the, the jailer said, well, come by tomorrow and I will let you pray over her and cast this so-called demon out of her. And the jailer, which unbeknownst to Brother Summerall, he called the newspaper and he called television stations and he called every public official, doctor, every lawyer, every city official that had ever been following the story. And there were over a hundred people at the room by the time Dr. Summerall, Brother Summerall came to pray over this little girl. And Dr. Summerall said that he actually hesitated and almost changed his mind about delivering the girl when he saw all these people because he said, I wasn't sure that it should be a public thing. And he goes, and truthfully, he goes, kind of fear gripped me. What if it don't work? And I'm, you know, cast out as a fool. And the Lord said, no, you're going to pray over this girl and I'm going to set her free. He said the Spirit of God spoke to him very directly. Tell the devil to come out of her publicly because he has made this a public spectacle. So Brother Soverall, he gives this account of the deliverance. And here are some of the excerpts from his book. He said, this was a spiritual warfare, not natural medicine. I had dealt with devils before and understood some of the antics Taking hold of her head with both hands, I cried, Come out of her, you evil and wicked spirit of hell. Come out of her in Jesus' name. She immediately began to rage again with tears flowing down her cheeks. She begged me to leave her alone. But she begged me in a low voice. And she Show, then she showed me the terrible marks on her arms and neck where she had been bitten at that moment. One of the demons was small and would run around quickly inside her body and cause all the different contusions upon her body. The big one would just bite her and blood would drain down wherever she was being bit. And she would scream and jerk and would begin to flop around. And there were terrible teeth marks, so severe that some small blood vessels underneath the skin were broken. Rather than feeling like quitting, he says, I went into the greatest battle of my life. I have never known anything like it. The devils would curse God and I would demand them to be quiet and I would tell them that God is holy. Then they would curse God the blood of Jesus and I would bind them reminding them that he is the master over every evil power and that his blood is truly holy they cursed me in the vilest language declaring that they would never leave they spoke to me in English even though Clarita spoke no English it seemed that the powers of darkness realized they were in deadly conflict Indeed, this was more than a battle for Clarita Velvela. 
with the press gawking behind me. I knew this was a battle for Manila and all of the Philippine Republic. And all of a sudden, a joy came over me and I smiled knowing that Jesus would win this battle. Amen. Finally, I felt the release that they had departed. Clarita relaxed. The demon look departed from her. Her eyes and her mouth smiled. I looked around and saw the newspaper men who had been weeping and their tears in their eyes of the doctors too. Hard-boiled jailers who were openly crying and God had set her free publicly. And she immediately prayed with me and invited Jesus into her heart. And it changed her, but it also changed a nation. Amen. That woman got so delivered in this chapter that she pulled the demon's hair out. And they found hair in her hand and under her fingernails, which after examining found that it was not human hair. They believed that it was the hair from the demon and she got totally delivered. Thank you, Jesus. As Brother Summerall thought, this deliverance was not just about a 17-year-old girl. This deliverance was about the fact that a detailed account of the deliverance was widely broadcast over the news in Manila the next day, filled with the testimony and the power of Jesus Christ. The next day, Brother Summerall's picture was on the front page with one headline reading, Devil Loses Round One. Another read, He Dies, The Devil Is Dead. And Manila Chronicles announced, The Thing Is Dead. Such a deliverance took place that it touched a whole nation it reached worldwide. It even got into America. And it was not done in hiding. It was done publicly. For some reason, we think that the power of God has got to be done privately, secretly, in the confines of the church. And yet the Lord wants to deliver people and set people free every day. I can't imagine you and me being afraid to share our faith. That we want to back off of our prayer. We want to back off of our testimony. We want to back off of our devotion. That we want to be a good Christian, but we don't want to be called out for it like we're some freak. Are we ashamed? Are we ashamed of our Lord Jesus Christ? Are we afraid of being called a fanatic? I had one guy tell me, he goes, you know what your problem is? I said, what's my problem? He goes, you're too saved. I didn't know what to tell him. I, so I said, well, thank you. I didn't know what else to say. I'd never been called too saved. We do not need to be ashamed of the manifestations of the Holy Ghost. The devil manifests himself in the, in, the, in the likes of people all the time. What makes people do what they do in the dark shadows and the secret and everything's hidden? Eventually it'll come out. The Bible said that we will tread upon serpents And we will tread upon scorpions. I once heard a story about several men that were out on the guided trail ride. High in the mountains somewhere as they were riding, one of the horses became startled and started to rear up. The other horses were upset by this disturbance and became very jittery along the first because of the first horse. The men could not understand what was wrong and so they all got off their horses to try to calm the horses down. And as they walked a few steps down the trail, they heard the sound of a rattlesnake rattling in the, with its tail. By this time, the horses were not alone in their fear. 
The men were also upset at the potential hazard of the rattlesnake up ahead on the trail. The trail guide, being very experienced with this type of situation, he walked ahead by himself to where the sound was coming. He saw the rattlesnake lying on the trail ahead, and as he approached the rattlesnake, he noticed the body was motionless and only the rattle was shaking. Gun in hand, the trail guide walked up to the snake while the rest of the men watched from a clear distance. They did not understand why he put his gun away and called them over to see the snake. But soon they discovered that he had seen a snake whose head had been crushed, but it still had a rattle on. I want to leave you with this thought at the end of this six-part series called The Spirit of Python. Satan may rattle his tail at you every so often, but when he does, we don't need to operate in fear. Jesus crushed the head of Satan. He did it as he died, as he died and rose again from the cross. Satan can't steal anything with, from you unless, like the men who were on the trail guide, do not understand that the head has already been crushed, that you're in control, that if God be for me, who could be against me? Amen. And with the power and the authority of the blood of Jesus, he has no dominion over us. You see, the spirit of Python is going to try to render you powerless through fear. You're going to get upset. You're going to be distraught. You're not going to be able to think right when you're, when, 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 when you're, when you're heavy burdened. Things aren't going to make sense. And you're going to try to make decisions that you think are wise, but they're unwise. And what you don't realize is that spirit of Python is squeezing you. And you can't breathe. And you can't think. You can't make quality decisions because fear or anger or frustration or not understanding is suffocating you. When the Holy Spirit prompts me to preach on something, It's because he knows the attack that's coming against the body of Christ at that time. People say, well, don't preach on the spirit of Python or the devil will come and try to squeeze the life out of us. No, 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 you don't understand. The Lord knew that the spirit of Python was going to come against you and try to squeeze the life out of you. So the Lord said, preach on the spirit of Python. So we knew the answer. Amen. You can break free yes. of his grip. Amen. Because the spirit of Python tries to render you powerless. But the Lord already crushed the serpent's head. Come on, even a, even a helpless baby can make a rattle noise. That's all he is. The spirit of Python will lose every time when you walk in the divine authority assigned to you. Amen. What would happen if your daily prayer started with, Lord, I really don't understand what I'm going through. But you do. And even though I don't get it, I know you're in control. And I know you'll help me. Bring me a, a calm. Bring me a peace. No more squeezing the life out of you. No more intimidation tactics. No more trying to run away and hide. No more sleepless nights. 
No more being drawn into the drama of life's crisis. I've never heard of anyone ever winning a battle by retreating. We must stand. We must stand strong. We must declare God's word. Yes, in fact, I am in a battle. And yes, I am in a war. And yes, I am in the middle of something. And my heart hurts. At times I feel alone. I even feel defeated at times. But God, I know you're perfect in all of your ways. Amen. And you'll help me through it. And Lord, even though I don't get it, I trust you. And I worship you like Job did. Yes. Amen. When he got all the bad news, he fell to his knees. He rent his coat and he worshiped. Yes. Who does that? Amen. You and I do that. Amen. That's what we do. Yes. We need to shout for joy. And let our voice be heard. Jesus paid a price publicly for you and for me. And I'm not going to be quiet about it. We too need to be saved publicly for all the world to see. Anybody that knows me knows who I am. I don't preach to people. I don't preach at people wherever I go. I don't preach at them. But I don't compromise in my words, in my deeds, in my attitudes. I don't change. I'm all the same all the time. Wherever I go, I bring peace. Wherever I go, I bring God's wisdom. I don't tell somebody, you just got to get saved. And I shake them and spit on them and knock them down. No. I look at them with the most tender eyes. I'm so sorry. You're going through what you're going through. But Jesus Christ will help you with that. He loves you that much. If you'll let me pray with you, I know he'll answer your prayer. Even if they say no, I pray for them. Numbers 26 and verse 24 through 26 says, May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Amen. It's known as the pastor's prayer in the Bible. And some pastors, they pray that over their people every service before they leave. We might as well admit the fact that the python is defeated. May we have no fear in our boldness to serve Jesus Christ. And the moment that we want to shrink back, the moment that we want to hide, the moment we just want to get out of the fire, may a holy boldness come upon us and say, no, I'm going to stand on the front lines for my Lord Jesus Christ because that's what he did for me on Calvary. May we never be silent about the goodness and the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The spirit of Python is dead. The spirit of Python is dead to me. And I will not allow him to squeeze the life out of me. I'm not retreating. I'm not backing away. I'm not fearing. I'm going to stand strong and stand tall. I'm going to serve more than I ever have. I'm going to give more than I ever have. I'm going to, I'm going to be a voice for Jesus Christ. I'm going to be bolder than I ever have. I'm going to be a serpent killer. A serpent slayer.
spirit of Python has no power over me. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we conclude our six-part series on the spirit of Python, Lord, we will not be quiet. We will not allow him to torment us, to cause a fear, to cause a worry, to cause us to shrink back. We, we will not. And even when bad news comes, Lord, we're going to go back to our, we, we serve a perfect God. In all that we do, Lord, you are perfect. And even if we do blow it, and even if we do go the wrong direction, or make the wrong decision, I'm always one step away from repentant and being right with my God. And I will be strong, and I will stand up, and I will be a voice. And I thank you, Lord, that we have defeated through you through the Holy Spirit, the spirit of Python, once and for all in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. amen. And amen. Anybody get anything out of that series? Amen. It took us six weeks to get that thing done, but by golly, we got her done, didn't we? Yes. I bless